Welcome to St. Andrew's Virtual Sunday School. Today's lesson is called Troubles in Judah and Israel. One after another, the kings of Israel have been evil, and we just had the worst one of all so far, King Ahab. Now Ahab has recently died, but his wife Jezebel, who's even worse, is still alive, and their son, King Jehoram, or King Joram for short, is now the head of the country, and he's just as bad as his parents. At one point, there was only one prophet of God who was still brave enough to speak out, and that man was Elijah. God had plans for Elijah's life, and one of those plans was to anoint a man named Jehu. So years later, after Elijah has gone up to heaven, we're now going to hear what's going to happen with Jehu. God told Elisha that the time had come to end the rule of this wicked family. So Elisha sent for a young prophet. Take this jar of olive oil, he said, and go to the army camp. Find a man named Jehu, one of the army officers, and anoint him king of Israel. And remember what it means to be anointed? That means you were chosen by God. You received God's blessing. So the young man arrived at the army camp and found the officers. I have a message for you, sir, he said to Jehu. When Jehu took him indoors, the prophet anointed him with oil and announced, God now proclaims you king of Israel. Jehu returned out of the building to be with his friends again. But he must have looked a little strange to them. Because they said, is everything all right? Can you guess, Jehu said, what happened? I am to be king, Jehu told them. They cheered. They were excited. They were so happy for him. They obviously had great faith in his ability as a leader. Jehu is to be king, they all cried. Just saying that didn't make Jehu king because there was another king on the throne already and Jehu would have to deal with that. And Jehu got his chariot ready and a band of his soldiers, and he went racing out of the camp, heading for the town of Jezreel. King Joram was staying in his palace there. Now Jezreel may sound familiar to you because there was a story we studied about Ahab in Jezreel. Remember the man named Naboth who had the vineyard? Ahab wanted that vineyard for his own, and in order to get it, Jezebel had the man falsely accused, and he was put to death. When Ahab returned to the property to take it over, Elijah was there waiting for him, and Elijah told him just how displeased God was with him. You have murdered this man, Elijah told him. As judgment, you and your line will no longer be kings in this country. God said, you will not lose the kingdom in your reign, but in your son's reign. That will be the end of your family dynasty as rulers of Israel. So King Joram is now in the palace at Jezreel, right by Naboth's vineyard. King Joram resting quietly following his injuries, and he was being visited by his nephew, King Ahaziah, the king of Judah. So part two of our story is called the crazy driver. So Jehu lost no time. He and his followers got into their chariots and sped off for Jezreel, driving fast. So King Joram is sitting in his palace at Jezreel, and he's being visited by his nephew, King Ahaziah of Judah. And unfortunately, Ahaziah followed his grandfather, Ahab, in his behavior. He worshipped Baal too, so at this time, both Judah and Israel are led by evil kings. Joram was resting quietly at the summer palace because he'd been wounded in battle and was recovering. The guard on top of the watchtower looked out the city gate and he saw a cloud of dust. It was Jehu's cavalcade in the distance and he reported it to the king. Go send a messenger to find out if they are friends or enemies, Joram ordered. They were too far away to tell. So a messenger was sent on horseback to meet up with the party, and when he galloped up to them, 
The man said, Why are you coming in peace? And Jehu wouldn't say exactly what his plans were, but he offered for the man to join him, and he did. He didn't return to his king to report back. He joined the group. Well, Joram couldn't figure out why, so he sent another messenger. But the second messenger also, when he found out it was Jehu, well, at this point they were close enough that the guard from the watchtower could get a better look, and he said, I know who it is. It's Jehu. Get my chariot ready at once, Joram ordered. Then he and King Ahaziah of Judah rode out to meet Jehu. Why did the two messengers not return to explain why Jehu was coming or what his message was? Do you come in peace? King Joram called out as he approached the group. How can there be peace while you and your mother Jezebel rule over Israel? Jehu replied. Now Joram knew for sure. Jehu would not normally speak to him that way. So he knew Jehu was trying to pick a fight with him. And with backed by all those soldiers, and Joram and Ahaziah are only two men out in the open, they turned and raced back to the city. It's treason, Ahaziah! Come on! Joram shouted. And they both wheeled their chariots about to return to Jezreel. But Jehu was not to be stopped. He shot an arrow with all his might, and it struck Jordan in the back between the shoulder blades and pierced straight through his heart, killing him instantly. Then Jehu pursued and killed Ahaziah, the king of Judah, too. And remember, he was also an evil king. Well, quickly news was brought to Jezebel that Jehu had killed her son. And the interesting point is where Jehu shot Joram was exactly where Naboth's vineyard was. As Elijah had prophesied, Ahab's family would come to its end, his rule would come to its end in that same location where Ahab spilled the blood of an innocent man. Interestingly, Jehu knew all this because as a soldier, he happened to be there that day when Elijah faced King Ahab and told him God's judgment upon him. And here it was, all coming true before his eyes. Well, quickly, news was brought to Queen Jezebel that Jehu had killed her son. And she had dressed in her finest clothes and jewels and sat at the window waiting for him to arrive. Soon Jehu's chariot came clattering up. You murderer! Jezebel shouted down. What are you doing here? Jehu didn't answer her. Instead, he turned away and looked up at the other windows of the palace and said, Is there anyone here on my side? And all the servants who were in the palace could hear him. And a few brave souls put their face close to the window so that Jehu could see them. And when those cautious heads appeared at the window, Jehu shouted to them, Throw her down, he ordered in a loud voice. And without a word, some of those palace servants went and took hold of Jezebel, threw her from the window, and killed her outright. Jehu was now king, and he showed no mercy. He killed every member of Ahab's family and many more people besides. He had to ensure that there was no one left of Ahab's house, Ahab's descendants, who would try to take the throne away from him. Jehu took seriously that he was God's servant. He was a tool of God to pass judgment on the people of Israel and on Ahab and his family especially. Jehu was now king. But he showed no mercy. He killed every member of Ahab's family and many others besides. He left no one alive who might possibly confront him and vie for the throne. He believed he was God's servant, a tool of God's vengeance, a tool of God's justice. The one thing I'd like you to think about with today's story is what we learn about God from it. 
And one thing I think we learned that comes up in several examples in the story is that when God makes a promise, God keeps the promise. Did you catch the different promises God had made to various people in the story? Probably the first promise he made was to Moses. Now, I know you're thinking, Moses wasn't in this story. What's she talking about? But God promised Moses he would always stand by his people. He would never turn his back on them. And even though the Israelites at this time had turned their back on God for the most part, were worshiping Baal and idols, God didn't give up on them. God is still fighting for them, still fighting for them to come back to him, to love him again. And God promised Moses up on Mount Sinai that he would always be steadfast and loving to his people. And we see that example in today's story. Another promise was the promise God made to Ahab. Now that wasn't a pleasant promise this time. It was a promise of punishment. It was a promise of judgment. And the judgment was that Ahab had sinned. Ahab had sinned too much, was not repentant, not truly repentant. Within a very short time, he was back to doing all his evil deeds again and had not changed at all. So God promised him, you will die on this spot one day. Your family's reign will end. It will not continue beyond your sons. And that happened in the story today. That promise was kept. Now God also promised Elijah something. That one day he would anoint a man named Jehu who would be king of Israel. And presumably Elijah did anoint that man. And in today's story, he is king of Israel. And God promised Elisha Jehu would rule, and Elisha carried through that promise. Not personally, but he did have his young apprentice go and anoint Jehu and announce him as the choice of God to be the king. So we'll see what kind of a king Jehu turns out to be. Although it might have seemed promising in that he was doing what God said, he knew that Ahab needed to be punished, that Ahab was getting what he deserved for his behavior, and Joram too. But in discussing the promises of God, does God break promises? According to the Bible, he doesn't. So God never breaks our, his promise to us. Do we break our promises to him? Sometimes. I will go to church every Sunday. I will go to Sunday school every Sunday. We don't. We don't always go. And now we can't go. So sometimes when our promises are broken, it's not our fault. We, we don't have control. Maybe your parents promised to take you away on vacation and because of the pandemic, it's out of their control and you can't go away. So sometimes promises are broken because we just fail at keeping them. Sometimes they're broken because there are things happen that are out of our control. But God has control of everything. So there's never anything that's out of his control. God's promises are true. God promises he will love us. God promises he will stand with us. He promises we will never be alone. If we turn to him and accept him, God promises us life in heaven with him, eternal life. God will never break a promise. Now people break promises and we get angry and we get hurt, but we should still forgive them. Forgiveness is a form of love. So when someone breaks a promise to you, it's okay to be upset initially, but then you should work on forgiving them. Because if you think about it, they're probably promises that you've made and broken too. So the only one who will make a promise and never break it will always stand by us is God. So the next time somebody breaks a promise to you, or maybe you break a promise to someone else, try to be more forgiving. Try to be more open about it and realize that sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes things happen and promises get broken whether we like it or not. You've probably broken promises too. So take care, have a good week, and don't forget God's promises are always kept. See you next time. Bye-bye.